Thank you all for being here. It's exciting to see a full lecture hall like this um, for this course, in particular here in this building, because I have fond memories of this uh, course in this building. The last time I taught it here was two years ago. Well, actually, the last time I taught it here was in 2018. And then, well, let's not talk about that. I want to start with an experiment that I've been doing for years and which I've actually not invented myself, which I've taken from my PhD advisor from David Mackay. I've got three cards here. One of these cards is red on either side. One of these cards is red on one side and white on the other side. And one of them is white on both sides. I'm going to take these cards. I'm going to put them in this nice little branded bag and then shake this bag around so that you can't see what's happening inside. All the cards get mixed up, they get shifted around. And now I'm gonna pull out just one of them. I'm not cheating, I'm just picking any one so that you don't know which one it is. And then I'm gonna take it out such that you can only see the upper side of the card. And the upper side, for those in the front, is red. Now the question to you is, what's the probability that the other side is also red? There are already answers. I'll give you a minute, because clearly many of you already have an answer. To think of an answer, you can talk to your neighbor as well if you want to. Okay, so it seems that most of you are looking like they have an answer. Some of you are already looking very bored, some, but some are still actually discussing. So I'll give you four possible answers to give. The first one is one half. The second one is two thirds. The third one is something completely different. I have my beautiful theory, it's one over pi. And the fourth one is, I don't know yet, you were too quick. I was still discussing with my, with my neighbor, okay? Who would like to answer number four? I'm not finished yet. Good, that's very useful because it means everyone is done. Everyone now has an opinion. You have to answer one of the other three, right? So who is for number one, one half? That's, I would say that's, yeah, it's more than a third and probably less than half. Two fifths of the room. Who is for two thirds? That's, a little bit more, but also just over half maybe. And who is for something else? No one, very good. So the answer to this is always the same. It's great to see that all of you had an opinion. You were all clear about one of the possible answers and you disagreed with each other. So not quite half and half, but nearly half and half. Actually, the per the percentages of the answers have shifted over the years, which I think is a good sign. And in fact, the correct answer is two thirds. So one way to think about this is there are three cards here. Sorry, three, three red sides here, right? And what I've revealed to you is that we've picked one of those three red sides, clearly, because it's here. So, in two out of these three cases, the other side is red. And in one of these three cases, the other side is white. Okay, that's the boring kind of playground answer to this question. It's informal, it's completely informal. Quick check, who's seen me do this before or someone else do this thing before? Uh, so some of you are, have, either, have either watched the videos before or you've been here for a while or you've, I don't know. Um, it's good to know though that it's not everyone yet. So that's, that's good. Um, this is, is a variant of the famous Monty Hall problem. So there's the game show problem where the host like, tells, opens one of the doors that doesn't contain the prize. Um, and I could have equally asked a much more boring question. I should, could have shown you a, a roulette board like this. 
and then ask the question of the type, given that I tell you that the, like, the wheel has just spun and some number has come up and I can tell you that the number is red, right? And then ask the question, what's the probability that the number is, let's say, even, right? And then you could have done the work yourself. It's a little bit tedious because you could have gone through and checked for all the red cards and checked how many of them are even and basically like, computed some probability that um, we would have an even number. What this is, is an inference problem. And this lecture course used to be called probabilistic inference and learning before we started the machine learning master course. It's a, pro it's a problem in which we're trying to reason about a value, a variable, the, 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 the correct value of some unobserved latent quantity. Here, the latent quantity is the other side of the card. Given some observed related quantity. In this case, it's the side of the card that we got, got to see. And in computer science and in machine learning and in, in many other disciplines, we call this observed stuff the data and the unobserved stuff hypotheses or model or latent quantities or whatever. And as you could clearly see, when we work with these kind of inference problems, we encounter a form of uncertainty. Because you're not totally certain what the other side is, right? But you have some information provided by the data, by the observation about the latent quantity. And you become more certain about it by the data. And this kind of problem is absolutely universal to the human condition. Pretty much everything we do all day is of this type. When you go outside in the morning, actually when you look outside your window to decide what kind of clothes to put on in the morning, you're, you're collecting some observations and then you infer what the temperature might be outside even though you haven't actually measured it. Or if a scientist does an experiment, they quite often can't actually measure the thing they really care about, they have to measure some related quantity. If you'd like to know the mass of the sun, you can't actually do that, but you have some various other measurements that you can combine to reason about what the mass of the sun might be. If a medical doctor does a diagnosis, creates a diagnosis for a patient, they usually don't actually know exactly what the ailment of the patient is. Instead, they collect symptoms and then combine the symptoms mentally to infer what the diagnosis should be. So this problem of inference is, and that's actually the entire point of today's lecture, is much, much broader than machine learning and AI and computer science. It's a fundamental part of being human and living in this world. But it's also a very fundamental problem that in fact, in some sense, generalizes what we would like from a machine that may automate reasoning. So if you've studied computer science before, before doing your machine learning master or your computer science master, then you've encountered the theory of computer science where you've learned about discrete state machines, about Turing machines, and about propositional logic. And these are all of the, of the kind of classic type of what a, like the, 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 these are machines that do the classic kind of reasoning that we know from, let's call it Boolean logic or propositional logic or even Aristotelian logic. They are statements of the type from A follows B. So if someone tells you that there's this rule that says from A follows B, then that's something you can implement typically on, at the very least, a Turing machine and it's associated with a truth table like this thing up there. If A, then B. So if A is true, then B has to be true, and non-B has to be false, right? So these are the kind of statements that you can write down as a rule, and this is the kind of stuff that computers were for. Uh, for, I don't know, the first half century of their existence. <laughs> 
to automate mathematical reasoning. But the kind of problem we just looked at, inference problems, are actually more general than that. They require us to give answers to the two parts of this truth table that aren't filled in. So for example, we have relationships like, if it rains, then the street gets wet. Trivial statement. By the way, I've taken that from Stefan Hameling, who I used to talk, teach this course with the very first time we did it. Now, if you watch, if you look outside, well, what, what the statement says is, if it rains, then the street gets wet. Huh? So if A, then B. But if you look outside and you see that the street is wet, what does that tell you about the weather 10 minutes ago? We all do this all the time, right? You go and say, huh? Huh? must have rained. But this conclusion, this deduction of the, from the observation, the street is wet, to it must have rained, is not actually filled in in this truth table, right? Because it's of the form, if B, if B, then A becomes more plausible. We can't do this in classic propositional logic because there could have been some other explanation for the wet street, right? So maybe there was someone out there right outside your window with a garden hose who made the street wet. So now it looks like it must have rained, but actually it, it hasn't. There are other possible explanations for the observation. And we take them into account kind of mentally by saying, well, I'm not totally certain, but it seems quite plausible that it has rained. And we do this all the time so much that we, we get almost kind of annoyed when people question this and become too like hung up on the rules. So I say, well, but the theorem says exactly this. And if you, like, you do it the other way around, it doesn't work. So uh, propositional logic has these two ways of reasoning. If A, then B, that's called the modus ponens, the way of putting things into the equation. And if B is false, then A must be false. If the street is dry, it cannot have rained. That's called modus tollens, the way of the excluded other things. But what we would like to be able to do is to say there's also numbers up there in this gray part. If it has rained, sorry, if the street is wet, so if B, then it becomes more plausible that it must have rained. Or if it has not rained, so if not A, and it's quite unlikely that the street is wet. Again, maybe there's someone out there with a garden hose, but typically the street's going to be dry. And those are exactly the kind of generalizations that probabilistic reasoning, what this entire lecture course is going to be about, allow us to do. They generalize the abilities of machines to reason about statements that are not following discrete or deterministic laws of nature. Yes? Uh, could you explain the coloring of the, of the screen So the coloring here is supposed to mean white is 0, black is 1. So if A, then non-B has 0 probability. If um, A, then B has probability 1. It's 100% probable. So it's certain. And then up there, there is just no statement. So gray just is supposed to indicate that Propositional logic does not allow you to say anything about those. So if you do not know, if, if, if A is not true, then you don't know anything about B, basically. Um, that's also sometimes stated as ex falsum quod libet. From the false, everything follows. So what we would like to be able to do is this. And what we'll now do over the course of just today is Construct the theory of probability, which allows us to exactly do, do this. And then in your homework this week, you'll show that this is actually true. And the main point of all of this was to point out that this is actually the more important way to reason about the world. And that's kind of why a lecture like this has to show up in the context of AI and machine learning, because the point of AI and machine learning is to build machines that reason about the world like humans do. And therefore, they have to be able to do this. They have to be a true generalization of the deterministic propositional reasoning systems that we have in classic, um, let's say, Turing machines, although that's a little bit too much, actually. <laughs>
And here's a quote from, uh, there's lots of famous people showing up in this course, James Clerk Maxwell, who said, the actual science of logic, so that's what computers should be about, is conversant at present only with things either certain, impossible, or entirely doubtful, none of which actually matter in the real world. Therefore, the true logic for this world is the calculus of probabilities, which takes into account the magnitude of the probability, which is or ought to be in a reasonable, today we would say, human's mind or person's mind. So this is what we're going to do in this course. We're going to construct a formal mathematical framework that allows us to reason about quantities that are not perfectly determined. And this is evidently a very, very general thing to do that goes beyond computer science and anything you might want machines to do. It's really a general description of reasoning, reasoning about the world. But this is a computer science class, so we'll actually be done with this pretty quickly after about three lectures. And then we'll start thinking about how to represent this reasoning system on a computer. And that will lead us to construct quite elegant mathematical frameworks that actually have been around for a long time, but have only recently made their way into computers properly. We'll discover, starting from Thursday, that unfortunately, reasoning with uncertainty can be computationally a little bit more challenging than just reasoning in a deterministic or propositional fashion, or deductive fashion, if you like. And that will require us to really think about how we do the computations correctly. And to do that, we'll often actually write code to think exactly about computational complexity of inference. And we'll also notice that we often have to make approximations and simplifications because otherwise the computation would be intractable. And then, of course, I am, and I'm going to come back to this several times even today, going to make connections to contemporary machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I'm going to try and be as close as possible to the state of the art so that you actually learn something meaningfully that, meaningful that you can take along into your professional career. But all of this is going to revolve around this equation, which I guess everyone knows. So does someone want to shout out what this is called? There is rule-based theorem, yeah. So Actually, we'll call it Bayes' theorem. I'll try and call it Bayes' theorem because there's also something called Bayes' rule that sometimes statisticians use, although we're not going to use it at all. Um, and you've all seen this before, and that's why today's lecture runs a bit of a risk of boring some of you because, of course, you've been through your undergraduate degree, you've had some stats course, you've had some stochastics course, you've had some basic undergraduate machine learning class, you've had whatever else, right? Maybe some of you have studied cognitive science. You've all seen Bayes', Bayes theorem everywhere, and you've done things like this. Slides like this that say, oh, so assume we've done some tests for COVID, and this test has a true positive rate of 93.8%. So if someone has the disease, the test is going to be positive 93.8% of the time. And it has a false negative rate of 4%, which means if someone has a negative test, uh, some, sorry, if someone doesn't have corona, the test is going to be negative most of the time, 96% of the time. And then you've plugged those numbers in, and maybe the last time you've done this probably is in your data literacy exam. Um, and you've done this kind of computation that you've probably all seen before, which gives these kind of interesting results, right? That, so maybe let's actually do it for a moment, right? So for those of you who I don't want to lose, so the way to do this is we just look at the previous slide, which contains Bayes' theorem. And so what the theorem says is maybe just to say it out loud a few times, and I'm going to say it a few more times today, the posterior probability so the probability to have the disease given the positive test is given by the probability to have the disease a priori before the test. So that's the prior probability multiplied by the likelihood for the disease. That's a conditional probability for having a, a positive test if you have the disease. So that's maybe the only important thing about this slide. 
We're using those words again. Remember that the likelihood is a function of the right-hand side. It's a probability of the left-hand side and a function of the right-hand side. Um, divided by, well, the probability for a positive test, which is the probability for a positive test given that you have the disease plus the other possible explanation. And what Bayes' theorem does is it relates the probability of the observation under one hypothesis to all possible explanations of the data. So in the, in, in the uh, numerator of this, of this fraction, we have one possible explanation. The person has the disease for the data. We've seen a positive test. And in the denominator, we see all possible explanations. You either have it or you don't, and you still get a positive test. We plug in the numbers. There's one number we don't know yet, which is how many people actually have the disease. That's the prior probability. And then we get an equation, and then we can even plot this as a function of this probability of having the, the disease. And you'll get, for some reasonable numbers, or during the height of the pandemic, or something like 1% of the population had the disease, then you get a positive probability with something like 20%. And then the thing that everyone is always supposed to be excited about is that this is a surprisingly low number given that the true positive rate is so high and the false negative rate is so low, right? But why? Well, because the prior is low, right? So if it's unlikely to have the disease in the first place, then an observation raises the probability, the a posteriori probability, but it only raises it by some kind of amount, right? And if the other explanation, not having the disease, is extremely unlikely, sorry, if extremely likely in this case, it's 90%, then even those 4% false negative rates are a decent explanation for the observation. And that's actually often the kind of argument people make for Bayes' theorem that it has this prior in there, and the prior is very important because it allows you to include this kind of information that you may already have a priori. Now, let's think back to this problem with the cards here. I think I have the time to do that. Huh? So, how would we do Bayesian inference here? Does someone want to shout out a, a formal description of how this works? There are three cards. The question is, we would like to know which card it is. Is it the white, white one, the white, red one, or the red, red one? And what we observe is a color of the top part of the card. So we could say, we have a card, which is either one or two or three, right? And then we have an observation. Let's call it R, because I can't say C for color. Let's say R, because I observe red, right? Then we can write down, first of all, a probability for these cards. What's that probability? One third. So, and it's one third if C is one, it's also if C is two, and also if C is three. The prior doesn't matter at all in this example. It's the same probability for every card because I just push them in there and shuffle the, the, the you know, shuffle the bag. So it's not always about the prior. In this case, actually, it's entirely about the likelihood. So what's the probability to see red if the card is the, well, let's say it's the red, red card. That's card number one, maybe. Let's say that's red, 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 white, white, white. What's the probability of this observation? One. What's the probability to see red if the card is the red-white one? One half, exactly. And what's the probability to see red if the card is the white-white one? At this point, I'm boring you, so it's zero, right? 
So now let's do this computation again. Our probability for the red red card, given that we've seen red, is the probability for the red red card, which is one third, times the probability to see red if it's the red card, that's one, divided by all possible explanations of seeing red. So that's one third for each card times one plus one half plus zero. And now you can cancel out the third and we're getting a three half one over, so that's two thirds, okay? Whew, worked. So Bayes' theorem isn't always about the prior, it's quite often about the likelihood as well. And actually this entire course, we will talk about priors because it's not always so easy. And basically the only reason really to care about priors is that we'll often talk about spaces in which it's not possible to assign one to everything a priori or one over the number of observations a priori because we'll talk about infinite dimensional spaces where this isn't, doesn't actually work. So that's though is the kind of the data literacy version of this. This is supposed to be probabilistic machine learning so we'll start correctly with a bit of math to get everyone up to speed on how to do probabilistic reasoning. And it, um, so does anyone know who invented probability theory? Hmm? Yes, Alfredo? Kolmogorov, ah, you, hmm. okay, yeah. Well, maybe actually the inventor of probability theory is Pierre Simon Laplace. I will show, show him in a few slides. But Laplace did this in like 1812, something like this. And if anyone has seen a math book from 1812, this is not really formal, right? They just write down lots and lots and lots of text and sometimes an equation. The, maybe the first person to properly formalize probability theory is indeed Andrei Nikolaevich Kalmogorov, a uh, Russian mathematician who wrote a wonderful book in 1933, published in German by the Springer Verlag. He actually wrote it in German, because it was 1933, um, called The Grundbegriffe der Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung. And we're going to go through his derivation, first in German, then in English. Apologies to everyone who's expecting an entirely English slide. There will be a slide with all the proper definitions in English in a moment. But this is the actual text from here, from page two. And the reason I'm showing you this is A, because I want everyone to have the same idea of what probability theory actually is, even though you've, many of you have seen these definitions before in probably, well, maybe a stochastics class or your math for machine learning class, but also because Kamagorov actually did something like very important for the development of this theory, which is that he showed that it's not some big philosophical spiel. So depending on how you've had your undergraduate education, you may have learned that Bayes' theorem is this wonderful thing that is sort of philosophically derived and it's based on the laws of common sense um, and that's a derivation that maybe goes back to Laplace and was also uh, strengthened by people like Richard Cox in the US, um, who are often cited as kind of the foundations of Bayesian reasoning. So they derive these rules by saying what we would like to have is something that conforms with our everyday experiences in inference. Like the example I showed you before of this probabilistic reasoning, right? If the street is wet, then somehow we should have some properties of these functions. What Kolmogorov did actually was very kind of subdued to show, actually, probabilistic reasoning is the only acceptable thing to do if all you want to do is to correctly measure stuff. So he relates probability theory, Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung, to measuring things correctly. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you manage to really follow this argument, then there is really no philosophical debate at all about why this is the right thing to do. So let's try and do that. Here's the original text, again, and then I'll go through it like properly in math. So this is 1933, so back even, in, even 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, 90 years ago, 
things were still being haggled out. So Kolmogorov writes, what we're going to do is we're going to consider an, a set of elements, let's call them chi, eta, sita, whatever, lowercase Greek characters, which we call elementary events. These days, this set is often called the universal set. But he has a more direct approach. He says it's elementary events. In the example of the roulette board, that's the wheel. Right? The thing that the croupier puts the, put the ball in. And it has elementary events, like the numbers. Actually, they're on the next slide. Right? They're 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, up to 36. And now, what we we'll actually care about is a set of derived events, a set of subsets of the elementary set. And we'll call that fraktur f. We call that the set of random events. And I'll just call it like that for a moment. It has a much more fancy name these days. And what we're going to need is actually the only thing we want from this set is that it makes sense, that we can distribute some truth across it and then that that's going to work. And the way that Kamagorov tries to phrase that is to say, first of all, I want this F to be something that he calls a Mengenkörper. And that's actually where all the magic lies. But thankfully, Kamagorov doesn't have to define this. He just cites in a footnote down here, Hausdorff, who says, a Mengenkörper is a system of sets such that their intersections, their differences, and their unions um, also all belong to the set. So if I have some element in that set of subsets of the elementary set, then if I have two such sets, their union is going to be in the set, in F, their intersection is going to be in F, and their difference is going to be in F. At least that's Hausdorff's formulation in 1933. And that's actually the important bit. After that, we just say, um, well, OK, there's one special thing we need to require is that the elementary set is going to be in this collection. So basically, the whole set is part of our F. And now we're going to do something to it. We're going to assign probability to events in this space. And this assignment is called, is done by a function, which we call p, of some element in the um, set of sets, called the probability of the event. And that assignment has to be such that it has to be a non-negative real number. It could be 0, but it has to be larger or equal than 0. The probability of the entire set has to be 1. So the probability of the entire roulette wheel is one. One of the numbers is going to come up. And then there is this special actual important rule, which is sometimes called additivity, which says that if you have two sets of events, A and B, so two elements of F, which are mutually disjo disjoint, they do not intersect with each other, then the probability of their union is the sum of their probabilities. So the, the plus sign here on the left is a set union. It says combine these two sets together, like a Python plus for sets. And the plus here on the right is a plus between real numbers. So these are two different things. So what this means is that if you go back to our um, roulette board, then we want this probability, this function, to have the important property that if you take two subsets, let's say the red and the black ones, the black numbers and the red numbers, if you assign a probability to this space of possible events f, then the probability of the union of the events that are in red and black has to be the sum of the probabilities for red and black. And I hope that everyone agrees that that's an absolutely like, non-contentious statement. Right? This is something you would really want to have from something you want to call a probability. 
There's basically no way to question this. So what we're doing is we have this roulette wheel here, which chooses from one of those numbers. And now that that's called this is the set E. And now we can construct all sorts of statements about the world, right? Instead of just saying it was the number 21, we want to be able to say it's a red number or a black number or an even number or a, a, an uneven number or it's one of these weird dozens or one of these other groups that, and basically this is how roulette works, right? Someone comes up with all these stupid other ways of explaining the number that have certain marginal probabilities and then the players feel like they're doing something smart by assigning their bets across this uh, board which actually they aren't, right? Because the probabilities of these derived sets are just directly implied by the probabilities for the underlying numbers. And that's exactly what we want to have from any kind of reasoning system that distributes truth. And a system that has these properties, Kolmogorov calls a Wahrscheinlichkeitsfeld. These days we call this a probability distribution. So these days, we actually um, you know, use English for this. And also, people have been careful to clean up a little bit. So we're going to do the derivations again. But you will see that they are basically the exact same thing. Now you've had enough time to look at, this, at these slides for, to not be entirely shocked by this statement. Here is, the, here is the, like a 2023 version of 1933. Let E be a space of elementary events. That's the roulette wheel. Now we consider the power set, so the set of all possible subsets of E, um, which I'm going to write like 2 to the E, because I don't want to use a curly P, because that looks like probability already. right? And um, we consider any collection of subsets. No, any subset of the power set, so any collection of subsets of E. Then such a collection, e, um, which we call random events, needs to have the following properties to be something we want to consider. And that thing we want to consider is going to be called a sigma algebra. And here is the reason why I haven't showed you this slide first. Because I don't know about you, but for me, when I first heard the word sigma algebra, my brain just shut off. Because it's like, what? That must be something very mathematical and complicated, so I, I, I'm, I can't, right? So we first did the proper, like the nice 1933 way of thinking about stuff. and now you'll realize that this fancy word sigma algebra is really just the word for the thing we just talked about. So a subset of the power set is called a sigma algebra if it contains the elementary, the set of elementary events, which is sometimes called the universal set. If it has the property that if a, if a set is in F, then its complement is also in F. So you will remember that, maybe you don't remember, but on the last slide, Hausdorff actually talks of differences between two sets. So he says, if one set, if two sets are in F, then their difference should also be in F. And this is actually kind of a weaker form of it, but it suffices, because you can construct the other statement from it. And the third property is that if a number of disjoint sets can be chosen, so pairwise disjoint sets in, in F, then actually, sorry, not disjoint, just any sub, any sequence of A's is in F, then their countable union is also in F. And again, Hausdorff says the union and the intersection, but we don't need the intersection actually, because you've all had propositional logic and you know rules like this, which are called the Morgan's laws which can be used to construct the statement that that also means that all intersections of the sets have to be in F. And therefore, also, the empty set has to be in F. Why? Well, because if A is in F, then its complement is in F. And the intersection between a set and its complement is the empty set. So it has to be in F. OK, good. This is called a sigma algebra. And the elements of F of such a sigma algebra are called measurable sets or Borel sets. And the space is then called a measurable space or a Borel space. Fancy words for this very, very simple stuff. So if you ever hear someone talk about sigma algebras or Borel spaces or measurable spaces, now you can be like, ah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 
so um, the space is the combination of these two things. So it's a construction on E, if you like. Right? You take E and then you construct something on it, a sigma algebra, that together makes it a space. While this F itself is a collection of sets called the sigma algebra, and E is a set. So we start with E, then we construct something on it that is constructed from subsets of E, and we call that the sigma algebra, and then we, com com we call the, the combined thing E with the constructed sigma algebra a space. So, so far, what we've done is we've defined measurable spaces. We've not defined probability distributions, and we'll do that. This was Kolmogorov's four and five axioms. We'll do that now. So, um, am I on the right? No, I'm not moving. Let's say we have such a measurable space, so a combination of a universal set and a sigma algebra, fancy words, a Borel space. Then consider a non-negative real function. That's already the first axiom of Kolmogorov already goes into, into this simple little sentence. So we're thinking of a function that maps to the non-negative reals, which has the following properties. The empty set has probability zero, Secondly, for any countable sequence of pairwise disjoint sets, so for any countable sequence of sets that do not overlap with each other, we have a property that's very important that's called sigma additivity. That's the one I already pointed out on Komogorov slides, which says that the probability of the union of this countable sequence is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual set. So this is a fancy equation, and what it just says is we want this rule of probability to work on this space meaningfully so that you don't accidentally lose probability if you add up sets or inject it without noticing. So if you take the atomic, the, the roulette wheel and you let your ball roll around it and then construct some, code, some kind of events that you want to talk about, like red and black and green and even and odd and so on, and you want to make sure that by talking about those derived events, we're not inventing, not confabulating probability or losing it. That's um, this object that has these properties, so this map from the sigma algebra to the real numbers, actually the non-negative real numbers, which contains the empty set and assigns probability zero to it and has sigma additivity, such functions are called measures. And they're called probability measures if they have the additional property that the universal set has probability one. So what that means is something on the roulette wheel is going to happen, nothing else. There is no probability for the ball flies off from the wheel. Actually, um, if you have this additional property, which makes it a probability measure, and then the assigned space is called a probability space, then we don't actually need the first one. And uh, I mean, the proof is down here, but pretty much, actually, we don't even need P of E is one. If we could just say, if there is any special set within the measurable space, which gets assigned a non-zero probability, then this holds, right? So if there's any set here which has a probability that is different from zero, then by the, 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 just the rules of set theory, we can, and sigma additivity, we can write this probability like this, and therefore the probability of the empty set has to be zero. So we could even leave this out if we had plugged in um, this assumption of P of E is one, and indeed, that's what Kamagorov does. So now, that's just slide, uh, page two, and now the guy kicks into action and says, oh, this is what mathematicians do. You write down five axioms, and now we can just show some cool things. The first thing he does is to show what's called the sum rule, which works as follows. So let's consider the fact that the entire set E is made up by definition of A and its complement for any set A. That means we can write the probability for the entire set by sigma additivity as P of A plus P of non-A, 
But by the rules of the definition of a probability measure, p of e is 1. Therefore, we can write p of a as 1 minus p of non a. And now, using again set theory to say um, a is equal to the interse itself intersected with the entire set, e, which is, can also be written for any set b as b plus non, plus non b, um, we can write the probability for the intersection, the probability of A and B, which in probability theory we rewrite like this, and I'm going to use this notation all over the place, P of A comma B, as the joint probability also, fancy word, for the probability of the intersection, or A and B, and plug in those results, and we see that P of A can be written as p of a and b, or p of a intersected with b, plus p of a intersected with non-b. So this sounds like a simple thing, but it's actually the first and most important, maybe, rule of probability theory. Why? Because it provides a mechanism for getting rid of a variable. If you've written a program and you want to get rid of one of the variables in it, what you need to do to compute the probability of just one variable is to sum over all the other variables. And without telling you too much, ahead of Thursday already, if you think of this as an array of the possible values of A and the possible values of B, then what this equation says is if you want the probability of A, then you have to call dot sum over the axis, axes that you don't want to keep. And that's why this probability is also often called the marginal probability, because if you had had an array on a piece of paper, then you could sum over the rows of the array, and on the margin of your piece of paper, you can write down that probability. So this is page six of the book. Now, Komogorov does something that is a little bit shady, and that's why some philosophers don't like it. He defines something. He says, we're just going to define this thing, which is called the conditional probability. We just call it conditional probability because that's what it is, but we just give it a name. It's not derived in any philosophical way whatsoever. There are other derivations of probability theory, for example, by Cox, which go through a long spiel of explaining why this is the right way to think of a conditional probability. It just says, P of B given A, is the probability of the intersection between A and B divided by the probability for A. That's just what it is. Of course, for this to work, we have to assume that P of A is larger than zero, so A has to be a non-empty set in particular. Then, um, by definition, we immediately see that we can write the joint P of A and B as P of B given A times P of A, or P of A given B given times P of B. You've all seen these rules before. Um, and now, actually, the only maybe interesting thing to show about this object, this defined object, is that itself defines a probability distribution. That's why we call it the something something probability, the conditional probability. By, well, I'm not going to do this. You can do it for yourself if you want to and just notice that we've now defined a probability. And we can use this definition to derive something that Kalmogorov calls the law of total probability, which is actually like a generalization of the sum rule, and which is the way we usually think of the sum rule. So, so far, I've, uh, the sum rule for Kalmogorov is just P of A and B, sorry, P of A is P of A and B plus P of A and non-B, but what if non-B can be split up in lots of other possible derived quantities? Well, then this is true, right? So if um, a, I, a, a1 to An is a, a sequence of disjoint sets, then we can write the um, probability of any event in the sigma algebra as the sum over the, well, actually, the joint probabilities between x and ai by um, sigma additivity. And we can use the definition of the uh, conditional distribution to write it with conditional distributions. And that's where we get 
the denominator in what, come, in what is to come next, because of course that's the big reveal, using those two statements, we can write down Bayes' theorem. There it is. And because the entire construction so far is hopefully unambiguous, we have to agree that this is the one way to reason about quantities that do not have a binary truth value, but for which we distribute truth across several elements in a collection of events. And that's it. That's the theory of probability. It consists of these, well, first of all, these axioms, which are really non-controversial. They really just say, what we're going to do is we're going to take truth, which is probability one. We just assign one. We just use the number one to, assign, to call that truth. And we're just going to distribute it across m more than one possible event. Instead of saying, there's just one event that's true and everything else is false, we're going to say this true can be distributed across a set E of possible events. And now we just have to make sure that when we talk about subsets of, those, of that set, that we construct the corresponding probabilities correctly in a measurable fashion. When we do that, then naturally the sum rule has to hold, the product rule has to hold, and therefore, of course, Bayes' theorem has to hold. So that's like a first year master's level description of Bayes' theorem that you've now seen many, many, many times over. And the only thing you might want to kind of wonder about why this is actually necessary is this one in there somewhere, right? And so maybe, has someone done that, no? Everyone has just accepted that one is the correct way to think about truth. So there's maybe two different questions you could have. One of them is why one? Why not something else? And of course, we could just choose some other number and say that's true. It's just one is particularly convenient. In fact, one other way is to say we don't talk about probabilities from zero to one, but from minus infinity to plus infinity just by taking the range zero, one and transforming it through some function, a logit, that puts it to minus infinity and plus infinity. And that's actually what we do in machine learning a lot. Why? Because it uses the entire floating point range and that's just really convenient on a modern computer. But other than that, it doesn't really matter. Then that just means that minus infinity means false and plus infinity means true and zero means one half. Okay, fine. The other question you could have is, well, why does it have to sum to just one number? That seems so constrained. And that's actually what most of the problems with probability theory come from, which is this, I said before, right? You have to say what E is. You have to say what E is and then assign one to it. And that's, it will turn out, is one of the major problems with this entire theory, that quite often there is something happening that you didn't expect. Some event of probability zero actually happens. Like, you know, the croupier flicks the ball and it flies out of the roulette wheel and lands outside. What happens then? What happens with the bets on the table if the, if the, the, the ball fl flies out of the wheel? So maybe you want to say that like, this comes down mathematically to something like, I want to be able to say there is more than one, but we're not allowed to do that because then reasoning breaks down. So here is my argument for why this is not a good thing to do. So, um, Let's as assume, for the sake of argument for a moment, that we had decided that there's actually more than truth. There is two possible truths. And they're mutually exclusive, but they can, they're both truth. They're both true. So we, say, we just say P of E is two, right? But we still mean, by one, we still mean true, right? Then we could, for example, split our E into two parts, A and non-A. Um, and let's just, for the sake of argument, say that both of them get assigned probability one, so they are both true at the same time. You see where this is headed, right? So then we can do some kind of game that, that you've seen in propositional logic a lot. So if two things that are mutually exclusive are both true, something stupid is gonna come out, right? So let's do this. Um, consider the probability of A and non-A, which by definition is the intersection between A and non-A. Um, so the intersection between A and non-A is zero, 
right? Here. Um, the empty set, so it's 0, times the probability for non-A, which is 1, which is 0. So therefore, A and non-A has to be false. Because it's the intersection of two disjoint sets. It's the empty set, and the empty set has probability 0. But also, our rule has assigned probability 1 to A and to non-A. So A is true, and non-A is also true. So therefore, by the rule of propositional logic, right, if A is true and non-A is true, then A and non-A is also true. So it's both false and true, and that's not good. We don't want statements that are at the same time false and true. So therefore, we have to assign probability 1, and we have to write down what E is before we start reasoning. And to be honest, spoiler alert, for the entire lecture course, we're going to use reasoning systems where that's not true. We're going to talk about real problems in the real world that are going to contain events that have probability zero under the prior. And we're just going to do it all the time. And we'll have to come back to think about what, what, what happens when we do that. OK, so that was the big spiel. For today, we've thought and played around with this theorem that you've seen all over the place already many, many, many times. Of course, you have good thing. Um, and there were people in history who didn't want you to learn about it. Famous people like Ronald Fisher, who would have really not cared for a lecture like this. He would have been happy if this equation would have been erased from human memory because he thought it was wrong. And he gave it a, like a funny, like a, he derided it by making it, assigning the name of some, from his perspective, naive, mid -century, a medieval, um, non-conformist priest to it, some Protestant priest, which was like a bad thing in Anglican society. Thomas Bayes, right? Ah, it's beige. this is Bayesian stuff, this is bad, right? That's what Fisher was arguing. But it's just measure theory. It's just assigning a finite probability to a set of possible events and then making sure that we are measuring them correctly. Now, in your homework, you're going to see that when you apply these fundamental rules, then you actually get a reasoning system that conforms to these properties that you would want from something more general. So it actually allows you to make statements like, the street is wet. Therefore, it seems more plausible now that it must have rained. Or it has not rained. Therefore, it seems more plausible now that the street is dry without being certain. That's the mathematical content. We have a few more minutes. Of course, I need to talk about admin. I also want to put a little bit into context of what's to come for the next semester, what we're into. I'm hoping that the lecture hall will stay as full as it is right now, even though we're going to be in different lecture halls, by the way. So just as a reminder, on Thursdays, we're in a different lecture hall. So don't come here on Thursday. We're over there, 21. One first question you might have is, how does this relate to this other lecture in the um, machine learning master taught by Professor Hein, the statistical uh, learning theory or statistical machine learning class. Actually, there used to be two separate classes, one called statistical learning theory and one called probabilistic inference and learning. And they were a bit of an like, uneasy pair. They were just both there, and they didn't really talk to each other. Um, and now with the machine learning master, we've sort of unified them and made sure that there are actually two lectures called probabilistic machine learning and statistical machine learning. And this term, the other one, is taught by my colleague, um, Professor Hein. And so first of all, what are the connections between those two? I very, very strongly recommend that you take both. I know that that's challenging. And for the machine learning masters, this is actually maybe the main challenge of this entire degree is to take both of these courses at the same time. But they are deliberately next to each other to expose you to these two different sets of ideas simultaneously. Historically, these two views have formed the foundation of AI and machine learning. On the one side, there is statistical learning theory, and on the other side, there is probabilistic inference and learning, or Bayesian machine learning, if you like. And there are, very different, there are many different ways in which one might talk about what they, what they refer to. And I'm sure that Professor Hein is going to give you a different perspective. And that's exactly the point. 
So the two of us are not coordinating with each other what we teach. I don't have, I mean, we, at some point I saw a list of the stuff he teaches and he has heard a few things that I'm going to teach, but it's not like every lecture is like neatly aligned with each other. That would also be nearly impossible. But there will be a few points where I will make very clear connections to the other lecture. In particular, at the uh, halfway through the section on Gaussian processes, I will talk about kernel machines and how the two like, objects relate to each other because there the connection is extremely close. There has been a phase in machine learning, you know, like when, when I entered the field in like, you know, a long time ago, uh, early 2000s, there were still these two camps, the Bayesians and the, what some people also derisively call the frequentists or the statistical learning theory people who were constantly at each other's throats and uh, arguing, bickering with each other about who had the right theory and had, like one side required theorems from the other that the other couldn't provide. All of this has sort of died because of deep learning, which is difficult to explain from either side. So uh, <laughs> we've all sort of started to like each other again. In, in 2012, we co-organized even a dark stool workshop together to kind of soothe each, each, each other's wounds. But actually from this, a really new perspective has emerged on deep learning, which is really exciting and we'll talk about it on, in both lectures. But to give you one high level idea, my high level idea of how the two relate to each other, one way to phrase this quite succinctly is to say statistical learning theory is about Bayesian reasoning where you don't say, that, where you don't say out loud what the prior is. You just say that there is a space of events but we, and there will be some prior but we won't talk about what it is. And then we'll just see how far we get and see what kind of statements we can make. In some sense that's more general because it allows us to talk about things without making hard decisions. But in some sense, that's also much more restrictive because it doesn't allow us to make concrete statements. That's it actually. Or a little bit more formally, in statistical learning theory, you will typically encounter models that are defined by some loss function defined on some model. And that loss function will have some relatively abstract properties um, and it's often constructed such that the algorithm works well. It might be convex, for example, to make sure that you get a very fast algorithm that converges fast and doesn't have much to compute. Um, and that's, in some sense, totally ad hoc, right? You just write down this thing that is convenient for your computer to work on. Then you run it, and because you've come up with it in this ad hoc way, you then have to spend a lot of time analyzing it to argue why it's a good thing. Right? If you say, oh, I'm going to minimize this loss function that's convex, then you have to say, well, this, this convex loss function is somehow very good because its minimum has some good properties that we're going to find. We're going to converge fast, and then once we're there, somehow this estimate is in some sense close to the truth under some assumptions. And those assumptions typically are strongly connected to the ones that a probabilistic formulation would also make using different language. An advantage of this is that sometimes those assumptions can be weaker, but the downside is that you often have to make asymptotic statements. You can only say in the limit of very many data points, something, something. And then the analysis will typically be of a worst case, worst case type. So, um, you know, assuming that the true function has some properties, we need to constrain it somehow, then our estimate is going to be at worst this far away after n points or asymptotically. Conversely, in the probabilistic framework, we will write down what's called a generative model. That's a joint probability distribution. So a P of data and thing we care about, a prior times the likelihood. And then once we've done that, we're done. Because the rest is just Bayes' theorem. We just need to apply Bayes' theorem and it will tell us what the correct answer is. Unfortunately, because, so we typically start by writing down this generative model and then we question it and say, ooh, are these good prior assumptions? What does this prior look like? Can we do it like, does this actually describe what we believe about the real world? Ah, yeah, maybe we really believe in this prior. Then we are duty bound by Bayes' theorem to compute the posterior. And what we'll typically then encounter is that computing this posterior is difficult because it requires complicated computations. So then what we'll do is we'll approximate it somehow. And by doing that, we'll actually deviate from 
the true formalism, but we'll try and stay somehow close to it. But the, the good thing about this is that if you believe in the prior, you don't have to question the algorithm anymore. You never have to go back, ah, oh, now I changed something slight about my prior, which means I've changed the loss function in some sense. Do I now have to redo all the proofs? Do I have to show everything again? Ah, no, because it's still just base theorem. Another great thing about this is that we can actually look at the posterior, and it's going to quantify uncertainty for us automatically out of the box. So we don't need to have worst case error estimates. We can just say, well, this is, this is measure. That's what we know. Posterior. Done. So we gain something by being very explicit about assumptions and relying on the mechanisms of Bayesian inference, probabilistic reasoning, to compute the object of interest. And we're paying for it typically with algorithmic cost. And so this course will contain a lot of algorithms and code examples and thinking about how expensive something actually is and how to approximate a complicated computation. So now, having been in here and uh, you're looking at the watch, you're thinking, OK, this is all fine, but why do I have to take this course in 2023 in a machine learning master when there is ChatGPT out there and stable diffusion and everyone talks about you know, uh, everything being automated and, right? Why do I still need to study this? Isn't this like 2005? Has nothing ever changed? Well, the next two slides are hopefully like my way of trying to convince you, but we'll come back to this many times, that this course is as important as it ever was and it's as close as it can possibly be to these new models that you've heard about. So everyone at this point in the machine learning world is totally stressed out and uh, you know, in, in various forms of either excitement or doomed worry uh, about the developments of, of the field on the product side. And the field is moving so fast that as people teaching in a university setting, we constantly have to ask ourselves whether what we're teaching is actually still relevant. So what I've done is I've actually changed the content of this course quite a bit from the last time I taught it, two years ago, which means that there will be stuff that is very close to the state of the art, hopefully soon. Although I ask you to bear with me while we still derive and construct the proper foundations for a while, because they are going to be very important. It also means that, especially towards the second half of the course, there will be a little bit of seat of the pants. So I ask, ask for your forgiveness if sometimes there will be things that are a little bit just developed, just finished five minutes ago, and so on. So what we're going to do, here's a very rough outline what I want to do in this course. We are going to spend the next two to three lectures, actually three lectures, thinking more about the foundations of probabilistic inference. We'll find out that in which sense it is actually computationally harder to reason about entire measures rather than one point estimate in statistical learning theory. We'll encounter interesting algebraic properties in these distributions that are useful to make things tractable again of various types. Some of them will be more algebraic, more structured, and some of them will be more analytic, so using derivatives and um, uh, dis geometric descriptions of functions. And then we will encounter something very important in this, um, a class of distributions, which you all know already, Gaussian distributions, which you will get to know much closer than you might want, um, because they are going to be our tool for the, almost the entire course. They are going to be the way of thinking about probabilities and we'll discover that they are very intricately linked to the concept of linear algebra and to differentiation. And you know that machine learning lives on differentiation these days. So we're actually going to find out, and I'm going to argue quite strongly, that Gaussian distributions are the fundamental object to think about. And they are even the fundamental object to think about deep neural networks. And I really want to make that case in lots of detail. So we'll spend a lot of time thinking about Gaussian models, almost the half of the course. Different aspects of it as well. And we'll try to connect that to the deep learning literature um, and in various different ways that we'll get to when we get there. And then towards the end of the class, actually depending on how it goes, I might take several different detours and point out some interesting 
other relationships that aren't directly connected to deep learning. Um, and how much time we'll have left for that depends a bit on how we move through the course over the next few weeks, um, and we'll see what might be interesting then. But in the course of this process, we will, well, first of all, of course, realize that the Bayesian perspective on machine learning provides very interesting functionality. This posterior isn't just an error bar on your estimate. It's actually an algebraic object that allows you to do really interesting things with a model, to probe it, to query it, to understand it, to build better algorithms on it, and to explain to other people what the model does. And we'll also encounter that the tools that you already know from deep learning like automatic differentiation, like array-based thinking, or array-based programming, and linear algebra are as important, if not even more important, in probabilistic reasoning. So if you think that deep learning is about autodiff, well, then actually you should be even more interested in this course, because we'll talk about gradients and Jacobians all the time, everywhere. And in fact, linear algebra will arrive as arise as something even more important, because it's not just about computing a gradient, but then what do you do with it? to get some meaningful statement. We'll write lots of code, which is also a kind of a new development in this class. Um, I've uh, made some real effort to write some proper JAX code that looks decent. You'll get to see some of it, like starting from next week, with lots of um, visualizations and examples. So today was actually maybe one of the classes with, with, with less examples. So I hope that there's going to be lots of interesting stuff for everyone in the room to see. I know that there's always people who want to see theorems, and some people who want to see visualizations, and some people want to see examples, and some people who really want to see the code, and we'll try and do all of these. There'll be some times where we'll spend really a long time thinking about some code and why something is implemented in a certain way, and then some other times when we just look at some pretty pictures. The final other argument that I want to make is that this is much broader than machine learning and AI. And that's why I started the lecture today the way I, I've been doing for the past 10 years or so. Because probabilistic inference is the generalization of propositional logic to statements that contain incomplete information to inference problems. And it has been important over the course of the entire history of quantitative science, starting with the absolutely amazing book by uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss from 1809, the theory of the celestial bodies that move on cone intersections, which, in which he derives the Gaussian distribution and the least squares estimator, to uh, Laplace's theory analytique de probabilité, um, which actually is the text that first writes down Bayes' theorem, because Bayes didn't actually write down his theorem. He just wrote down a prior and a likelihood and forgot to normalize it. Um, to all its applications and derived statements in the natural sciences. Thermodynamics is pretty much just probability theory. So the theorems of Maxwell and Boltzmann and Gibbs, they are really just writing down probability measures and then operating on them. Kamagorov in 1933 formalized it properly and then following him a lot of other scientists used them. So for example, um, quantum electrodynamics, or quant like, actually quantum field theory in general, the work that is often attributed to Feynman and people like Dirac, is all about manipulating probability distributions on some awkward spaces, where you have to be careful because things are infinite dimensional and dynamic and moving through continuous time, and then everything gets really complicated. But in the end, it's just probability theory. And if you've heard of a path integral, well, a path integral is a probabilistic model. And if you've seen Feynman diagrams that some people have tattooed on their forearms, that's probability theory. All the way to computer science. If you've used a compression algorithm, if you've used your phone today, you've used a probabilistic algorithm, probably a Gallagher code or a Turbo code, so a linear probabilistic model to encode and decode signals over noisy channels. That's just probability theory. And much of contemporary machine learning was influenced very deeply by 
people like, of course, I have to cite David Bakai because he was my PhD advisor, but also many, many other people who describe themselves as Bayesians, myself included. Um, and it is still a central way of thinking, a fundamental paradigm for machine learning to this day, despite large language models and no code and whatsoever. So if you really want to be an expert in machine learning and AI and want to build these models rather than just you know, become the next form of a web developer with ChatGPT, then you need to understand these theorems. It has been useful to know about this way of thinking for the last 200 years since Gauss. So it's quite unlikely that it'll suddenly stop being useful within the next two years. In fact, I think this, these are going to be, this, the stuff we're going to see, at least on a high level, is content that will be useful for your entire career, despite all the craziness currently happening in the field. Here's the final slide. Those of you who've ever had a lecture by me before know that I always do this at the end. Here's a QR code in which you can leave feedback for this lecture. Please do so, because this is my way of figuring out whether the course works or not. By the time the evaluation rolls around, run by the department, it's way too late. So I want to know what you think of every individual lecture, and we will talk about this feedback at the beginning of every lecture. So please hold your phone up, look at the QR code. You can also find the feedback sheet on Ilias without the QR code, um, but that's the easy way to get to. So here's a summary of what we did today. If you want to reason in a world that does not follow deductive, deterministic, propositional logic, if you're not René Descartes, then you have to reason under uncertainty. And there is one correct way, mathematically correct way, to reason about latent quantities given observed quantities. And that is by assigning a finite amount of truth, one, across the space of all possible events you want to consider, and then making sure you're constructing derived statements from those elements in a measurable fashion. So by correctly adding things, basically, when you, do, when you construct them. And that leads to two rules of probability called the sum rule and the product rule, which together make up this fundamental theorem of inference called Bayes' theorem, even though Thomas Bayes didn't actually write it down. Laplace did. This provides a extremely powerful framework for inference that is, goes beyond computer science. But in this course, we'll talk about how to realize it in computer science. And that means that, first of all, we realize you can do pretty powerful things if you use a modern computer. We don't have to do what statisticians have been doing for the last 100 years, which is to do things on pen and paper, where you have to make sure that you can solve integrals, which is really complicated in the Bayesian framework. But instead, we can use computers with the modern power of, in particular, the machine learning stack, automatic differentiation, linear algebra, to construct very powerful tools, which in fact provide a theoretic foundation for contemporary AI and machine learning. And how exactly that looks, I'm going to tell you over the course of this entire term. Thank you very much.